significant TV, significant stories, significant entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Fran McNeil, and joining me in the studio today is Dr. A. Scott McNeil, VP and Chief Medical Officer with Delaware Valley Community Health. Hey, Scott McNeil. Hey, wait a minute. We could be related, but we are. And I said that this morning with your brother as yes, well. Yes, yes. How cool is that? Very, very cool. Entrepreneurship, medicine. What a connection. And family. And family, yes. and family. Well, I want to jump right in. I mean, health is such an important topic in today's political and economic world. And yet, really, at the core, health is personal. It, it's, a, it's a mindset. It impacts your family. Why did you choose medicine mm. as your vocation? I, I, I've asked, been asked that so many times during the course of my life and career. And you know, the question now is more meaningful, because uh, I can tell people that I've always wanted to be a doctor for as far back as maybe 12, 10 years mm. old. It's all I can remember ever wanting to do and not necessarily know why. I do believe it's a calling. But when I started to get more into the educational component of medicine, as well as the business background of medicine, people ask, well, you know, you were so passionate about being a great doctor. How did you move away from direct patient care? Right. And I didn't have a good answer for that until I just sat back one day and realized, well, my mother's a retired teacher, and my father's a retired businessman. It's really <laughs> not that difficult of an answer. <laughs> Who else inspires you? Right. Your parents. Right. So, right. Yeah. But um, I, but it's all I've ever thought about doing. It's all it's my it's my love and, mm -hmm. and working with patients and working with those that want to work in, in healthcare is such a passion for me. Mm -hmm. And in your role, you really get to influence people who have that same passion. In fact, one of the earlier guests was someone who you were their mentor. Yes. yes. Um, how does that happen? Talk to me a little bit about the doctor, the DO. Um, how is that different from an MD, mm -hmm. and why did you choose the DO? I, I speak on that a lot, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I search, I, that's the question you always get at, how is it different? Mm -hmm. And I usually respond by saying, let's talk about the similarities. Okay, Because Great. I think in this country, we always want to have things different, and once we do that in our minds, we want to make one better than the other. What is better, mm -hmm. Coke or Pepsi? What is better, McDonald's <laughs> or Burger King? Why can't things coexist? Oh, uh, osteopathic okay. medicine is, always had its roots in uh, a more holistic approach to care. Yes. And therefore, most of the osteopaths in the country usually go into primary care. Mm -hmm. And that was all I wanted to ever do. Mm -hmm. So although I could have applied to both MD and DO schools, I thought then and think now that the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine is the best medical school in this region for creating primary care doctors. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to do. So I did my homework mm -hmm. and went with what I thought was the best mm -hmm. school, not necessarily worrying about what initial after my name was more known or more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, I refer to it as a minority degree, which just sim simply means that there's less of us. Mm. In the definition of minority, there's nothing that says being inferior, Right. it just right. left of us. Mm -hmm. And being already a minority, I'm not worried about what people might perceive. I could have all kinds of letters after my name and I could walk through a door and people are going to think what they want to think. Mm -hmm. The simple fact is that um, DOs are well qualified, well trained, and again, usually specialized in primary care. Although your previous guest was a breast surgeon. Right. So right. it doesn't have she to be specialized. primary care. Right. Um, so more rooted in holistic care, mm -hmm. but in this day and age in most areas across the country, particularly even in my own organization, most of the doctors that work for me are MDs. Mm -hmm. So we work side by side. And if that's not enough, my wife's an MD. <laughs> so it just shows that we all get along. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about you starting your own organization. Um, you know, many physicians at one point in time actually started their own private practice. And now a lot of folks in the medical industry really work for a hospital. Mm -hmm. You started your own organization. Why well, the, and the, how? The organization I work for now really is not mine. So mm -hmm. that's not, that isn't. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, the Delaware Valley Community Health is a private nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, so it's not my organization, but mm -hmm. I've had a lot of influence on the development right. of the organization right. over the last Thank number you. of years. Um, the, 
the way Delaware Valley Community Health works is we're known as what's called an FQHC or a federally qualified health center. Mm -hmm. And the federally qualified health centers are those uh, health centers like, like mine mm -hmm. like, uh, that have multi-specialty primary care. So we do adult medicine and pediatrics, OBGYN. We have care for HIV patients. We do dental, podiatric medicine. So it's a variety of primary care services for all types of patients that come in. But what's different and why we have that FQHC status is that we also have uh, grant funding and special funding from the federal government to make sure that we care for those, most, those patients most at risk. So you'll see these kinds of organizations usually in more inner city areas or possibly more rural areas. We're in Hawaii, we're in Guam. Our types of organizations are all over the country. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's making sure that there is access to, to, to good, competent primary care services. Mm -hmm. My organization <coughs> is one of the biggest in the Philadelphia area. Uh, we have five sites. Right. Uh, we have an operating budget of about $25 million. Wow. Um, and again, roughly a third of that comes in this grant from the federal government, which of course there are lots of strings and lots of oversight, which is good. Right. Uh, at the same time, it allows us to care for, again, these most at-risk patients who oftentimes don't have access to quality primary care services. Mm -hmm. um, I am the chief medical officer, so I'm in charge of all the clinicians, all of anybody that has a license, the social workers, the doctors, the dentists, uh, and I am also in charge of making sure that all of our policies are in place mm -hmm. and that we communicate with the hospital systems and the other and the, and the uh, managed care organizations across the region. Um, so we are a very, very collaborative organization in what we do. Mm. Primary care, has that always meant the same thing kind of in the last, I don't know, 50 years? Uh, very good question, mm -hmm. very good question. Um, it, it is continuing to change. Um, I think that we've seen for a variety of reasons there are increasing responsibilities on primary care physicians. Um, unfortunately, many of that's coming from cost savings changes, right. which is what's happened in healthcare a lot. Um, but it's also been driven by the fact that we've got you know, um, more technology, mm -hmm. we've got more empowered patients out there. Yes. Um, the internet has helped fuel a lot more information so that um, what primary care physicians are responsible for and what they get involved in nowadays. And this is something special about my kinds of organization. Um, we go way beyond. We're really a public health entity. Mm -hmm. So we are getting a lot involved in social aspects of medicine. It isn't just really making sure that you are getting a checkup and getting certain tests done, but are we really doing preventative services? Are we really looking into your area and see what's causing some of the other problems? Mm -hmm. uh, your, your question leads to a, a national movement that's happened in the last 10 years around behavioral health services. So primary Sorry. care services were often just thought about as the physical health. Mm -hmm. But now we talk about um, wellness mm -hmm. and, and, and prevention across the whole spectrum of, of the human spirit. So it's your spiritual, your behavioral, your mm -hmm. you know, uh, physical health. Mm -hmm. And we're even adding now more about your financial health. Really? Because we know that finances oftentimes are the leading cause of people's stress and background. Oh, right. Financial right. is whether I decide to go to the doctor or not. Financial right. is whether I decide to take my medicine or whether I go out and buy food with the money that I have. Mm -hmm. So if we don't bring in the, your financial health into the picture and don't think about that, we may not be addressing all that's happening around you. Mm -hmm. So yes, primary care. Primary care now means so much more than it did many mm -hmm. years ago. How do you then help your team stay abreast community by community where the factors of financial versus social versus behavioral may be different and the demographics are different. I mean, how do you, yeah, how do you help your team navigate through working with humans? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Another excellent question yeah. anyway. It is what makes my job hard and what makes the, the, the people that work for me very, very hard. Mm -hmm. um, but it shows you the dedication of the kinds of providers that work for me. Mm -hmm. Many of them are, have extensive training in public health. Many of them uh, also do missionary work. They work with Doctors Without Borders. These are people like myself that have been dedicated to primary care as well as public health. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they really are immersed in the population and the neighborhoods that they serve. Many of them came from some of these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So it, it only makes sense that you feel more comfortable accessing care from somebody that understands your culture or speaks your language mm -hmm. or knows the, the, the boundaries and the, the things that happen in your community. Mm -hmm. And if I have providers that don't know that, I often send them out into the community. Oh, 
Okay. A okay. story I'd like to tell many, many years ago, I was working with a, a, a Philadelphia Head Start program, and they had a very well-meaning nutritionist that was coming in and talking to these mothers. And many of these mothers were 15, 16, 17 years old. They were children themselves in, 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 in the strictest definition. And in her well-meaning, she was talking about how to cook and prepare certain feel, uh, uh, foods that were more healthy. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there listening to her, and I see the glassy-eyed look of these young mothers in the, in, in the audience, and they don't sell that food where they live. Oh, oh. They don't okay. cook food that way. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to give that advice, mm -hmm. but right. if it doesn't pertain to the people that are there, it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. You need to go into the stores that they shop at. You need to see how they cook their and prepare their food, and then come up with a menu that's still healthy. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. when it becomes difficult. Right. So if I have practitioners that do that want to work for me but don't understand the community, I will make them do those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Go to the church, go to the barber shop, go to the local corner grocery store, see mm -hmm. what's available so that you can be able to give actually good help, healthy advice rather than giving generic advice that, again, mm -hmm. doesn't really help that community. Mm -hmm. Given your dedication and passion around public health and really making it work for the community, what are some best practices from really running the organization that you're involved in that could be transferable to the private health system um, and or how you know, our policymakers look at public health? Another fantastic question, especially mm -hmm. with what's happening in, in terms of politics right now. Mm -hmm. It is, again, the kind of organization, the FQHC, that I work for. Um, oftentimes the public, uh, the, the government is pulling from us mm -hmm. a lot of data, a lot of infrastructure, because what is very quietly seen is that our outcomes, and of course everything is measured these days. It's not mm -hmm. a matter of just saying that you're a good medic medical provider, but looking at what your outcomes show. Our outcomes are often superior to what private practices have. Mm. And we're taking care of more vulnerable patients. Right, right. So people are really stunned by that. It's like, how is that happening? Well, part of why it's happening is because we have, again, providers that truly want to work mm. with these communities mm -hmm. and are less concerned about the entrepreneurial part of medicine. I've taken that responsibility. I tell them that. Mm -hmm. you, everybody says you work for me, but actually, I work for you. Okay. I take care of all the worry about the billing and all of mm -hmm. that, so you can actually devote your entire practice to just only worrying about your patient population mm -hmm. and not oh, worrying what about. A privilege. And so, yeah. therefore, yeah. I think our outcomes are because we removed that concern mm -hmm. that you might see in private practices. Mm -hmm. As your previous guest talked about, being a private practitioner and you're having your own practice, in, especially in the, the Northeast Corridor, but maybe in the entire country is so difficult these days. Mm -hmm. And therefore you have a number of private practice doctors that I think sometimes are making decisions that are based more on financial than they are mm -hmm. what's best for the patient. And mm -hmm. I, we know that that's not right, but they also have mouths to feed and bills to right. pay. Right. So I think that's why um, the kind of organizations that, that I work for have these better outcomes and mm -hmm. why that's being talked about on a, a public stage. Right. about how we can continue and, and if you listen now and to listen to what particularly what Hillary Clinton is talking about mm -hmm. remember the term FQHC mm -hmm. she's talking about continuing to fund even more and expand more of these kinds right. of organizations across the country because of the great work that we do we've always received bipartisan report support mm -hmm. there's not an elected official that does not have underserved constituents it, in their right. area so it's area. not this is right. not a Republican Democrat no. argument no. we've always received good funding and good support, but it's expanding. And under our present uh, president, he has expanded this more. And part of the ACA, his, his what is known as Obamacare, mm -hmm. part of that expansion is also with FQHC. So mm -hmm. Obamacare means so much more than what most people understand it to be. Mm -hmm. And part of what's written in that law is also the expansion of these kinds of organizations. Wow. Well, I would love for the audience to know how to get in touch with your organization. Would you share the website? Sure. It, so the organization is called Delaware Valley Community Health, so that's dvch.org. Mm -hmm. And we have a very interactive website. There's a lot of good information about our providers and our mission and where our sites are and our availability. We take all insurances. Um, and there's also uh, educational opportunities. So people that want to volunteer or get involved or be mentored if they want to have questions about how, to, how they can get into healthcare, uh, there's available websites there, on, uh, information on that website. 
Terrific. Well, our time is up. Yep. It's amazing how quickly 15 minutes goes, <laughs> and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day. Um, thanks for taking that financial burden off of your team so that they can focus on great patient care and continue to do the work that you do. Right. It's really important, and as you said, it's being tracked, it's being measured, and it's become a best practice. Yes. So yes. thank you. Thank you for having thank me. You. Okay. My pleasure. Significant stories, significant entrepreneurs, and significant impact in our community and yours. Join us again as we continue to explore with Significant TV.